Hello humans, Master Dinnerflex here, bringing you the low quality content you deserve, and today I'm going to do something a little unique, uh, and that is I'm going to be doing an analysis on a deck based on future support. So I don't know how I'm going to name it, but it's probably going to be like deck analysis. And this is not a deck profile, as you can see from all this nonsense on screen. This is basically a discussion on deck building for a deck at a certain time period. And I think it's a little better than just giving you a deck profile for decks we're getting in the future. Because the meta and just how the game could be played in general and due to ban list... Um, the theory can change, the deck list can change over time, which is why I don't think future deck profiles are always the best until it's such an early future to come that you know what's going to happen by then. But this is, uh, Battle of Chaos is a long time away, so we can see some major, major fundamental changes to the game by the time we get this, like ban list, meta adaptions, etc., etc., that it's not safe to give you a deck profile, so I'm going to give you an analysis of the deck. And I'm also going to be doing this for live twins, but let's just go ahead and get straight into it now that I've talked your ear off. So, Lilith, obviously it's the same, but now let's discuss the new card, Alice Lady of Lament. If you were struggling to understand what I think of this card, this card is absolutely insane. Like, nuts and this might be a little weird to people who are kind of familiar with lair or they might not understand lair entirely um lair of darkness as a deck has some strengths that are kind of insane but the weakness comes down to its extreme dependency on lair of darkness and its lack of consistency cards uh and this is actually both of those. Uh, this, when it's normal summon, you can target a Lady of Limit in your graveyard special summon it. That can include another copy of itself. But it also is a really strong follow-up. Because you don't want, just want to play several turns of Lilith Control. If you have a turn where you can go for game, go for game. Don't draw it out. And Alice is a great way to do that. And... It's like what I've been doing with Tour Guide earlier. So you really want to go for game the moment you can, and Alice is a way to do that. Um, but that's one of its lesser effects. You can banish one trap from your hand or graveyard, special summon this card from your hand. Oh, so it is a free extender by banishing traps from your graveyard, which doesn't mean anything, because Malice, that this Lady of the Land, can recycle them back. So that doesn't mean anything. And even from your hand, it's just a... Free special summon is effectively uh, the tricky, I guess. But that's fine because when you're in a really gr when you're in a very oppressive board, those traps weren't going to get you much of anywhere, anyways. Um, but also, this makes cards like Imperm and Evenly Matched way scarier because after they start interacting with your opponent's board, then you can just start throwing monsters at it. So that's an exceptional effect. But I haven't even gotten over the most important effect of this card. If this card is tributed or destroyed by your opponent, you can add one Fiend-type monster whose stats combined are exactly 2,000. So, every Lady of Lament, except itself, because it can't search itself, Token Collector, and a few other things. Uh, that is kind of insane. Because first off, it means this is a Tribute Fodder that pays for itself. And because of that, this and another Lady of Lament is three Tributes on its own. The Lady of Lament itself, like Lilith, Alice as the second, and then Alice will search another Lilith, which is the third. So without Lair of Darkness ever being in circulation, you have three trap searches. So that is really, really nice. Uh, but because this also says destroyed by your opponent, there are plenty of games where I have impermed my opponent's Baroness, I special summon this, crashed it into something, Search Lilith, activate Lair, normal Lilith that I just searched and got rid of something. That happens a lot. You can just crash this into a board, and since it's in a damage step, they have to have a way to negate the activation, and if they don't, you just search Lilith, and that's your normal summon. 
So this card is absolutely exceptional. This card is so insane. Um, I honestly think you should just unquestionably like play three of this. Maybe two, depending on how a format shapes, but this card's kind of insane. Because one final thing, this card has 2,000 defense, which means Arima, the good boy here, went from having realistically no good search targets for the deck to being an exceptional monster to have both in hand and on field. Because originally, before Sky Prison, Diablos just sucked. It was awful. It was an anti-synergy card. Because the whole theme of this deck is tributing your opponent's cards for cost, but Diablos wants you to tribute your own, and it itself doesn't do much of anything without Lair of Darkness in circulation anyways. It's just a big body, but a big body doesn't really cut it when cards like Access Code exist, or Zeus exists. Like, this card is just straight up terrible, and it's all it's been really since very early on in this deck's history, this card's been just all around very not great for the deck. Uh, it's an anti-synergetic boss monster, so like, Arima had no real search target, so the only thing you were ever doing with it was tossing it to search lair. But now, Arima can search Malice. Uh, Alice, my bad. It can search Sky Prison. Two very powerful, very relevant cards to this deck. So now, you have this whole chain of synergy where Lilith and Arima are like such insane tutors. Lilith, Alice, Arima, and even Sky Prison, because they all get you two more cards. Lilith will get you more traps, Alice will get you more Ladies of Lament, whether that be in the hand or on the field, while also accessing your extra deck. And then Arima can not only get Lair of Darkness, but it can also get Alice, which can get Lilith, or it can get Sky Prison, which can get Lair of Darkness, or any of the spells and traps, which can also cycle back Lady of Lament. So there's this massive circular formation between these cards that just didn't exist beforehand. And Sky Prison is a boss monster that really should have been what Diablos is like, where it has synergy with the deck. Your deck is all about setting trap cards and having them survive so you can use them. Or, well, King of the Sky Prison promotes that. But in addition to that, after you use them or you decide you want to summon this, you can to get another trap card, or more importantly, a spell card. A spell card is a far superior search to any trap card, unless that trap card has a spell effect like Metaverse and Back to the Front, or even, in some cases, Reckless Greed, as you saw earlier. That's what you want to be setting with Sky Prison in the deck, but because Arima can search this, um, it is a far more consistent part of this deck. Uh, in comparison to like other trap decks where you're you just have to hard draw it, or in the case of Trap Trick, where it actually can search this as well, so that's pretty cool. Um, but that's like kind of the thing here. It's also a massive push for damage. Three thousand is quite a lot. Uh, so that's it for like the layer of darkness monsters themselves that I think you should just always play. Unquestionably, if you're playing a layer of darkness deck that's not like it a variant like uh, Snakes or Infernoid. This, these 12 monsters should probably be in the deck outside of maybe Alice to 2, but I do honestly think this card's just such a fantastic way to play without Lair that it maybe should be at 3, and then you should maybe play a Malice uh, just to make sure this card's always functional. Um, now, uh, Sangan, and let's just put all these fiends up here. I'll put Malice up here. So, Tour Guide, Skarm, Sangan. So Tour Guide actually got a lot weaker. I shouldn't say a lot weaker, because it's still the same power level. It just became a lot less necessary. Uh, because Alice is effectively just a backwards Tour Guide, where you get the Lady of Lament out of your graveyard instead of the deck. But when Alice gets it back, it has its effects. Whereas Tour Guide, that is not the case. Its effects are negated, which is fine, because it can still tribute for Lair. But this contribute for lair while also getting you a trap card which is very very nice so tour guide a lot of the time is just going to be to pull stuff out of the deck um but not necessarily to have a major impact 
just to get uh, your cards in circulation. But also, tour guide, I still think there should be a some of them in your deck, just because I think Ties of the Brethren is now a necessity in this deck. And tour guide is such a great way to bait out Ash Blossom so that Ties ignores any other card in your opponent's hand. Because what happens if they Ash Tour Guide and he just ties, your opponent has accomplished nothing. They've turned four monsters into three, which they're going to get a, you're going to get a trap and a hand trap, which means you didn't really care that they threw an Ash Blossom at you. If anything, that's worse for them because they have one less card. And whatever you were going to summon is kind of irrelevant, or whatever uh, you were going to summon off Tour Guide is relevant because Ties brought it out. Um... So that's something to keep in mind here. Skarm, I think, has almost entirely lost its functionality outside of a very small handful of situations. And the reason that is is because one of the things about Skarm previously is that it was an Arima search target that was more passable than Diablos uh, just because it had 2,000 defense and it could very, very slowly get you to Lilith. But I mean very slowly. But now, Alice just does it at a much higher speed, which means I don't even think Skarm is even passable at this point. The only thing you can do is search Alice, because um, Alice can't search herself, but Arima can, so that's pointless. Or it can search Tour Guide, but as I said earlier, Tour Guide is much less of a necessity in this deck. So Skarm might entirely fall out of this deck. However, a card that has not been a lesser priority is still assumed at the state at the same power level is Sangan. And if anything, it actually gained a little more power of why you want to play it. Because now Ties, I honestly think it's just a true natural staple in the deck. Because now you have so many engine fiend monsters that this car that uh Ties. It's like always activatable. You will. It's very hard to brick on it. And even if it doesn't resolve, you still have seen your engine pieces. So that is why um, I think this is just a part of the deck. And if this is a part of the deck, that means Sangan is always going to be a nice target to summon off this. Because every time you get a trap, you also get a hand trap. And now let's go over the hand traps because this is a little weird. This deck will not play Crossout Designator. Um, not because uh, it's... Well, actually, to put it quite simply, this deck doesn't give a shit about nearly any hand traps ever. This deck doesn't care about hand traps. It cares about back row removal and negations. Anything not that, the deck doesn't care. Like, if you get Ash Blossomed on an Arima, you don't care that much. Your hand has to already be not playable for that to matter. Uh, so hand traps don't really impact this deck that much, especially once you have establishment, or you at least draw a lair or an attributor, then you literally don't care. Your opponent's hand could be seven hand traps, and you just don't care. So there's no reason to play cross out in this deck. So this is what I want to call an anti-cross out kind of lineup. So this is a little weird of a statement, but... Crossout Designator has a lot of weird counterplay to it where you can not play Crossout and you cannot play for Crossout. Then you can play Crossout and not play for Crossout. Then you can not play Crossout, play for Crossout, and then play for Crossout, play Crossout. So that's like really weird, but it pretty much means. You can have your normal hand trap lineup and not play cross out and just, oh well, they had cross out. Or you can play the normal hand trap lineup and play cross out and say, okay, when my opponent uses these on me, then I'll use cross out. Then you can not play cross out, but play hand traps that cross out is far less likely to hit, like Ghost Mourner and stuff like that. And then there's cross out, and then also playing targets for people that are playing the lesser targets. That's the thing about cross out, and I think the ideal place for this deck to be is the third one, 
where it is playing for crossout, but not playing crossout. Um, I think that is the optimal place for this deck to be, which is why I think the hand traps can really just be whatever. Just keep in mind crossout designator exists. Uh, the only one that I think would be fine to play that is a common crossout hit is Imperm and Effect Veiler. Uh, that is just due to the fact uh, that Veiler, I'll go over in the action deck, but Imperm is nice because it is a card that puts itself in the graveyard for Alice. Even if it accomplishes nothing, it puts itself into the graveyard for Alice. So that is really nice. And then Lair of Darkness, obvious. And then the pots. Um, honestly, I'm going to be truthfully honest. Either one of these is correct. Because they both have their own unique up and downs. Pot of Extravagance is nice. Because um, it lets you play Reckless Greed. Which I know a lot of people won't do. I just find it hilarious. But the real, real reason Extravagance has something ahead of Desire... Uh, Prosperity, my bad. It's because... King of the Sky Prison setting Extravagance is far stronger than uh, Sky Prison setting Prosperity. Because if you are summoning a Sky Prison after you have Establishment, you just want to go for game. And that Extrav, even if it just banishes a bunch of random extra deck monsters that you might have even wanted, you can still do the same amount of damage that turn. But Prosperity is not. So that means it's not a great thing to set off of Sky Prison, and Sky Prison is already a natural consistency card because it can set terraforming. So a lot of the value of Prosperity kind of goes away with setting it, but Prosperity has the benefit of being a far better consistency card than Extravagance, while at the same time never interfering with your extra deck. So that's why I think whichever you want... It's literally preference here. Um, the extra deck in Lair has always been for emotional support. Um, there are, like, fairly important cards in it, but you can play an entire match without it. So, no worries about that. Ties have already explained. Terraforming is just Lair Darkness. And then Emperor might explain, so I'll go over this one. This is what I like to call the three trap slot in Lair. And this is devoted entirely to the three of trap card that you want to be your win condition whether it be sanctum ddg or some kind of other card like torrential whichever is your most important trap that you're setting off a of lilith is this slot and i think right now and i think even to when we get it for me it's going to be ddg um i think sanctum is in a really bad spot right now because of droplets and all this other kind of cards that you can just negate sanctum with that it is not in a great spot. Um, then we got Infinite Impermanence. Um, like I said, it just puts itself in the graveyard. Back to the front, I don't think it's a three of anymore, for me at least, uh, just because Alice kind of accomplishes what Back to the Front is for and builds not around Sanctum. So you don't need to play nearly as many of these, but it's still a nice option to have. Metaverse is just another terraforming and then these ojamas as you can see are a break they're not actually uh, supposed to be in the deck i just wanted to mention some cards here because this as you can see isn't a 40 card deck because these ojamas aren't real diablos i've already explained uh so the viruses i know a lot of people really like viruses in this deck but the problem is they're really really terrible just straight up awful the only thing I can say is, for the viruses is at least now Eradicator can be set with Sky Prison and your opponent can be punished for it. The issue I have with that is this is best against trap decks and against trap decks they can also play Sky Prison. So that is a really, really awkward spot to put Eradicator in. Um, because if you're going against spells, they're activating the spells outside of Sky Striker. So I really don't know that this is the best choice. And the other one is Full Force. This one's a lot more playable now that we have Sky Prison and Alice, both of them being targets. But uh, it's still a very much going first trap, and you have to hope you don't hit a floater decks, which is why I don't like this one either. 
Um, Reckless Greed is a meme. Uh, Compulse, also kind of a meme. I mean, it's decent, but it's more meme-like. And the main meme is that uh, you can bounce Sky Prison with it to, uh, after you're done attacking with it, just go re-protect all your back row, and that's very hilarious. Punishment and Ice Dragons, I think, are actually pretty good traps, even though Prison is bad against, uh, what's it called? Uh, Drytron. You can still, like, take random things out of the graveyard to just reborn for Link plays, but also... DDG is such a powerful win condition against Drytron on its own that the Sky Prison just sitting there is kind of fine because you won't need to use it anyways. And then Skill Drain and goes in. I want to mention these. I don't like Floodgates too often in Lair, but if you're going to play Floodgates, it's goes and Match and Skill Drain. All the others are terrible, and I'll explain why soon. Uh, side deck I want to mention. Token Collector, like I said earlier, Search with Alice. So that's a good option this deck has. Not only can it just destroy a soul, a sword soul turn, but it can also remove tokens you give you with your to your opponent with Lair of Darkness, so you can go for game easier. So that is something to keep in mind. And um, engine I wanted to mention is the Brave Token engine. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this either because a Lilith is a more impactful than one Negation because you get a trap on your turn and a trap on your opponent's turn that is also a disruption. So you're trading a lot of the time two disruptions for your opponent for this one, which is not optimal. Which, to be fair, you could go one and one where you just, like, summon the negation and then just have a little sit there until your opponent's turn and end start. But uh, this is... I can see it, but I don't know that it's that great. Uh, Red Eyes Fusion... This is another option. I see a lot of lists play it. I mean, there's literally nothing to discuss because Dragoon doesn't have synergy with anything. Uh, it's just kind of its own standalone card to protect whatever win condition. I mean, it's whatever. Uh, Fusion of Destiny, other, on the other hand, actually has some synergies with this deck. Um, and that is in the form of Dasher and Denier. Um, Denier is better than Celestial because this can summon itself after a Fusion Destiny... To be tribute fodder, which is nice, but also Dasher has m synergy because it has a tribute effect. You can tribute one other monster to make it gain a thousand attacks, so that's kind of nice. Um, and then one final thing I want to mention is Alice doesn't care what trap you banish. It doesn't have to be normal traps. It can banish any trap. So if you're if you kind of want to play some uh, counter traps, that's fine. Because Alice can use them, it's just you can't tutor them out of the deck. That's the only thing about them. And then another Ojama break. Cards I want to steer you away from, or at least kind of mention why I don't think they're very good, is Super Poly. Even though I think Super Poly could have a good format coming up, uh, Super Poly, the only time you should be playing this card is when Super Poly is good without Layer of Darkness being on field. That is something a lot of people forget with this deck is Lair of Darkness needs to hit the field before you start considering what you want to go with it. Which is why I think Super Poly is very bad because you're just not casually playing Super Poly in anything. So if that's the case, you shouldn't play it in here. Even though it has more layers of synergy, it still requires you to have Lair of Darkness, which is already a flaw the deck has. So, and that's one of the weaknesses. However, we can always fall into a format where Super Poly is actually pretty decent, and then it becomes exceptional. And here, it's just that format actually has to come up. You can't just blindly put this in your deck and wonder why it's not working very well. And then other floodgates I want to mention are very bad is cards like Imperial Order, Summon Limit, and this one's actually gotten a lot better, Tikaboo. But um, Imperial Order is stupid. Because Layer of Darkness is your win condition, so you floodgate yourself. That's dumb. And then Summon Limit is very bad because it can only go first. And it's just straight up awful. Rivalry is bad because um, Sky Prison is your actual win condition. And that's that doesn't accomplish anything. So 
Um, the only one that's even kind of passable past goes in its skill drain is Tikaboo, just because now that Sky Prison is a new boss monster that's a rock, it doesn't interfere with the fiends. The problem is, uh, with Tikaboo is that it's always going to be a card that prevent that makes you lose slower rather than win you a game. And it also is definitely one of these cards I would consider, like... It, it it doesn't help you win that much because their main goal isn't to hit um, your back row, it's to hit lair. And a lot of the times they can just not care about this card. Even when it's exceptional, it's still, there's always something better that can be done. Um, this card, however, while well, these ones are opinionated, this one is a fact, you can no longer play this card in the deck. And that is not due to, oh, the format shifting. That is because of a ruling. Sky Prison re keeps itself revealed in your hand while you're using the protection effect. And this card re requires you to reveal your entire hand. Now this is a problem because you cannot, by, by Konami's ruling, you cannot reveal a card for cost if it is remaining revealed. Which that is very weird. So pretty much, if you activate Sky Prison, you cannot activate a pointer. Which means these two are conflicts of interest, and I think Sky Prison is just far better than a pointer. Um, so that's some fun facts for you. Uh, extra deck, uh, we actually got a new option now, which is the Dark Charm Umbral. And this can just turn your random ass tokens into something very, very terrifying. Because, unlike all the other Charmers, this one can actually grab some pretty scary targets, because some of the best extra deck monsters are dark monsters. So it actually rewards you for outing a board. And that's pretty terrifying, and also since it's a spellcaster, you can climb into Selene, and if you're playing Effect Baylor, which is what I mentioned earlier, you can go into Access Code. So this is a pretty nice engine. And if you are playing Gozen, you can take a Dark out of the Grave Order with Umbral, and then still make Unicorn, and then still make Access Code. So that's something very funny. Um, Borg Blocker, Beat Cop, those are still the same to this day, except now we have a new Rank 3 option, which is uh, the DDD package, which is Darius and Makina. And this is pretty nice, because it means Tour Guide that can't do anything, like there's no ties, there's no lair can still be two disruptions, which is kind of nice. And then Breaksword, this is a cool interaction I want to show you. If you have a back row that's being protected by Sky Prison and you summon this, you can target your protected back row and an opponent's card, destroy your opponent's card, nothing happens to the back row because this card says destroy them, not destroy both or destroy those targets. Meaning it doesn't care how many get destroyed as long as you just target both. So that's really funny. And then Fortune Tune, Downer, Zeus, another option. This option is the best a against a Phoenix Destroyer. Because Phoenix Destroyer will force two detachments from this. Which means that you could go into Downer into Zeus. But if they, if they decide to try to hit the Downer, you can just turn this into Zeus and you still have the two materials. Which means this card with Downard and Zeus will always Zeus a Phoenix Destroyer. So that is pretty cool. Um, but that's basically all I wanted to go over. Thank you all for watching. This was a very, very long video. Um, I hope I was insightful enough to kind of give you an idea of what to do with the deck in the future. And if you guys want to see more stuff like this, let me know. Because these are pretty long videos and you have to really go out of your way to watch them. But, um, it is what it is. But, yep, that's about it. Thank you all for watching, and remember, Master Interplex will take your soul.